A new show has joined the Collins Last Stand family. It's called Knockback, and it's a retro-fueled podcast co-hosted by my brother, lead designer of Sesame Workshop, Dagan Moriarty. On Knockback, we discuss all of the things we love from our past. Video games, television shows, movies, toys, books, and much more. If that sounds good to you, please subscribe to the show on podcast services or at soundcloud.com slash CLS Knockback. And remember, Knockback, SideQuest, and Fireside Chats are fan-funded, so please consider showing your support for CLS on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand, which nets you all sorts of perks, including early access to shows, exclusive videos and podcasts, and much more. Thank you for your continued kindness, generosity, and support. Now, on to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Colin's Last Stand side quest right here on YouTube. My name is Colin Moriarty. As always, I hope today's video finds you and yours very well. Today's episode of the show is dedicated to Far Cry 5, which I've been playing a little bit in my spare time, and I know a lot of you out there have been playing and enjoying it as well. The game's getting great marks, great reviews for the most part, but there's this weird kind of through line between a lot of the reviews and a lot of the criticism that I'm seeing from mainstream games journalism, or at least corners of mainstream games journalism, that seeks to politicize basically everything to fit their specific worldview, which I find really strange. Instead of criticizing what the game is or what the game could be within the parameters of what the game sets out to do, people are basically criticizing alternate reality versions of the game that don't exist, but that they wish existed. It doesn't really make any sense. So I wanted to talk about that today. I hope you enjoy the video. I'll see you on the other side. I like politics. No, I love politics. I've lived and breathed politics since I became politically aware as a child poring over issues of Newsday with my dad during Desert Storm. So I would never begrudge anyone their closely held ideology and opinions. But I feel a line is clearly crossed when you attempt to shoehorn that ideology and those opinions into everything you encounter, which is why I wanted to talk to you today about a pernicious trend developing in corners of mainstream games coverage, the arbitrary wedging in of politics into criticism, and the diminishment of what a given game manages to accomplish or not accomplish based on nothing more than specific, narrow, rigid worldviews. This brand of criticism, shallow and predictable at its core, and completely useless to consumers, is akin to watching Schindler's List, ignoring its intentions, and wishing it was about World War II's Pacific Theater instead. Rather than criticizing what's there, what's meant to be there, or what could even reasonably be there, this brand of criticism angles towards manufactured from whole cloth issues that don't even pertain to a given game, its aim, or its tangible value to players. The newest undeserving target of the games journalism political hive mind is Far Cry 5, the most recent entry in a franchise started way back in 2004. Far Cry 5 takes place in modern day Montana, a large American state at the northern edge of the country. It's one of the biggest American states, only California, Texas, and Alaska are larger, and it's also one of the least populated states, with only a million people spread across 150,000 square miles of territory. In other words, it's the perfect setting for a Far Cry game. And considering it's the first Far Cry game to take place in the US, the original Far Cry and Far Cry 3 took place in the Pacific, Far Cry 2 took place in Africa, and Far Cry 4 took place in Asia, it comes packing an extra tinge of intrigue. How would Ubisoft deal with the story, protagonists, and antagonists? How would it balance the franchise's panache with a setting that, for many players, will be inherently more believable, understandable, and relatable than, say, exotic savannas, faraway archipelagos, or the sky-piercing Himalayan mountains? Ubisoft tackled the challenge by drawing from recent American history. In the game, a fictional location in deep rural Montana called Hope County has been slowly and steadily overrun by religious cultists hailing from an organization called Eden's Gate. Eden's Gate is led by a charismatic leader named Joseph Seed, and he and his adherents are armed to the teeth, readying for a vague apocalyptic calamity, coupled with what's seen as inevitable conflict with local, state, and federal authorities. Indeed, that's exactly how the game gets underway. A U.S. Marshal, accompanied by local police, including your character, a voiceless deputy, travels to Hope County to serve Seed with an arrest warrant. That's when all hell breaks loose, separating the cops and the Marshal, and forcing an inexperienced deputy into action, isolated, underpowered, unprepared, and outright frightened. Here, Far Cry 5 begins. The wildly obvious real-life parallel to Joseph Seed and Eden's Gate is, of course, David Koresh and the Branch Davidian cult. In American parlance, the term Waco, which is actually a sizable town in Texas, is typically shorthand for Koresh, his religious organization, and its violent conflict with the federal government. In 1993, the feds attempted to serve Koresh a search warrant in order to pursue what the ATF rightly assumed was a substantial stockpile of weapons and ammunition stored at his cult's compound. This turned into a prolonged armed conflict between the Branch Davidians and the U.S. government. 
After an initial firefight took the lives of a half dozen Branch Davidians and four ATF agents, a standoff between the two sides lasting nearly two months ended with the death of 76 people, including Koresh himself. Now, if David Koresh looks familiar to you, it's probably because of the glasses. The influence couldn't be any more obvious here. And speaking of obvious, the connection between the way things started at Waco and the way things start in Hope County are also clear as day. In my research, it doesn't seem Ubisoft talks a great deal about this, but they don't have to. They've openly telegraphed all of this to the audience, from Seed's messianic complex to the warrant serving gone horribly wrong. The thing is, some games journalists are either ignorant of history or simply choose to outright ignore it in order to manufacture their own set of arbitrary expectations, draw their own arbitrary conclusions as to what Far Cry 5 should be about, and then harbor ill will towards the game for not meeting said arbitrary expectations. Sadly, this is happening with more regularity recently, the most recent example being Kingdom Come Deliverance, a game attacked for not having more people of color in 13th century Bohemia. And no, I'm not making that up, that's a real grievance. One outlet particularly well known for its unintentionally droll takes refused to cover the game at all, doing a major disservice to its readership. I did a whole video on that, so you should go check that out, but either way, no, you're not crazy. This all sounds familiar because it just keeps on happening, and so I will keep on calling it out as long as I have to. Here's what the game's journalist hive mind wants Far Cry 5 to be about. Donald Trump. That's it. The articles and reviews I've been reading in preparation for this video are pretty much all the same. Far Cry 5 doesn't go anywhere close to being a commentary on Trump's America, or on red state voters, or gun owners, or Republicans, or whatever else evil apparently permeates from the middle of the country, and therefore it's a gigantic narrative failure. Don't let facts get in the way like that Far Cry 5's development began a year before Donald Trump even started running for president, two years before he won the Republican primary, and nearly three years before he became president. The game cannot deal with what didn't exist when it was being made, and as a result, you see really strange reviews and think pieces emanating from corners of games journalism that all sound shockingly similar to one another, just like when Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus came out last year, and games journalists tethered it to the age of Trump, even though the game was in development going back to halfway through Obama's second term, and even though it's a sequel to an in-process story. They call that projection. Let's jump into some examples that illustrate my point. Polygon's Ben Kachera gave Far Cry 5 a 6.5 in his review, and it's not the score that bothers me. Truth be told, in my time with Far Cry 5, I've not been blown away by any means, though I have far more to do and see in the game before I draw a final conclusion. What bothers me is that so much of Kachera's criticism stems from Far Cry 5 not being the specific Far Cry 5 he himself would have cooked up. His opinions don't seem to grasp onto what the game is trying to say or do, but what he thinks the game should be trying to say or do. It's as if he's criticizing a game that doesn't exist. In a companion piece to his review, Kachera writes, quote, The game's timidity and lack of investment in its own setup sinks what could have been an otherwise enjoyable entry in the series. The game has no idea what it wants to be, which allows it to collapse into a meandering, defiantly inoffensive mess, end quote. But Kachera doesn't seem to understand what the setup even is, and so it's no surprise he misses completely what the game wants to be. Kachera somehow thinks that a game that took years to make, but only came out a little over a year into Trump's tenure in the White House, should be all about Trump. It's nonsensical, showing a stunning lack of understanding of how video games are even made, and a shocking insertion not of opinions on the game as it is, but opinions on an alternate version of the game that wasn't actually made. It's audacious, really. Kuchera talks about Far Cry 5 being inoffensive, but it's not offense or lack thereof that bothers him, it's that the right people aren't offended. It seems as if he wants to reduce Montana and its people to a caricature, but Montana isn't the state he seems to think it is. It's a politically vibrant, independent state, one that votes for Republicans at the federal level, yet one that currently has a Democratic senator and a Democratic governor. Indeed, Montana has had a Democratic governor going way back to George W. Bush's re-election in 2004, and hasn't had two Republican senators since Theodore Roosevelt was president. This isn't some former Confederate state with a deep red heritage. Kachera would be wise to research political history before assuming that Far Cry 5 would be some ruthless commentary on a people who have shown incredible political flexibility and open-mindedness over the decades. Indeed, you'd think he'd see the people of Hope County with a little more kindness. As inoffensive as it may be to him, Far Cry 5 is unlikely to be as inoffensive to those that understand the locale and the people, a people racked by drug addiction, economic depression, and chronic uncertainty, the very types of people that get sucked into the likes of the Koresh slash Seed gravity well. But Kachera isn't alone. Austin Walker of Waypoint writes the following in his review of Far Cry 5. Quote, This is a game that undeniably knows that Donald Trump is president, but cannot decide if that fact should be punchline or key plot device. In some moments, it feels as if Far Cry 5 wants to take a neutral position and represent some true complexity of rural America. Take, for instance, the fact that various characters will speak to their various opinions about the country's gun culture, with some disappointed in our addiction to assault rifles and others not getting the big deal about guns. 
yet when facing more obviously troubling truths like the racism and xenophobia that swept Trump into office, Far Cry 5 hedges its bets." End quote. Like Kachera, Walker isn't only merely upset that Far Cry 5 doesn't touch on his pet grievances. He too seeks to remove the nuance from the people, the situation, and the geographic location so that it fits a caricature, where only the bumbling idiots live, and where there are no shades of grey whatsoever. The people of Montana can't possibly be the victims of Seed, they must be guilty of something. This will likely surprise Walker, but there actually is true complexity in rural America, reflected in the very types of conversations he mentions. But like Kuchera, Walker wants Far Cry 5 to deal with issues that it never intended on dealing with, couldn't possibly deal with considering the timing of the game's development, and never once claimed it would deal with to begin with. I don't get it. It's just another way to signal to the world that since he's troubled by the Trump presidency, everyone should be, and everything should deal with his perpetual trauma. Frankly, the way both of these guys talk about Far Cry suggests to me that they might not have that much experience, or any experience at all, with the franchise. Far Cry games were always the melding of the ridiculous with the serious. They always stressed the gameplay over story, and they always relied a great deal on over-the-top villains, serious issues only touched upon briefly, like human trafficking in Far Cry 3 or the drug trade in Far Cry 4, and a certain suspension of disbelief. I don't recall Kachera or Walker writing endless think pieces about those games though, about how they didn't go deep enough or far enough into territory, if I'm being frank, a hell of a lot more serious than what Far Cry 5 is dealing with. But that's because they can't be professionally aggrieved under those circumstances. Here they can let their chronic distaste freely fly, though as usual I have no idea who they're writing to or for. And if Ubisoft went in an extreme direction, made Seed a full-blown racist, Far Cry 5 a commentary on Trump, and attacked Republicans, they definitely have a new set of grievances, because they literally always do. Over at The Guardian, my old friend Keza McDonald writes that Far Cry 5, quote, stays well away from the real-world issues that clearly inspired its themes, end quote. But I really couldn't disagree with her more. It openly embraces the themes that inspired it. Themes of religious zealotry, economic desperation, a need to belong, rural isolation, America's history with religious separatism and extremism, and on and on. It can't be said enough that Trump didn't inspire this game, its setting, its characters, or its story, so why would the game focus on him? She continues, noting that there are vague in-game references to Trump, like the purported recording of Trump with a Russian prostitute, but those are asides that easily could be written in later. By the time Trump was elected, Far Cry 5 was almost certainly playable from beginning to end in some crude pre-alpha form, and mostly content complete, which is common for a game a year out. She concludes, quote, The Edensgate cultists might be extremists, but they're emphatically not white supremacists. It comes close to trying to say something, but never actually does, end quote. That Seed and his cult aren't white supremacists nor misogynists, there are black people and other minorities and empowered women fighting alongside men all over the game, is mentioned in this piece and others like it with a tangible disappointment. But why? Their lack of racism is true to form. As the New York Times noted in 1993, the Branch Davidians that clearly inspired the game, quote, were mostly white people in their 30s and 40s from Texas, but there were also blacks from Jamaica and England, Americans with diverse ethnic backgrounds and others from a half dozen foreign countries, end quote. Far Cry 5 has nothing to do with race. It never had anything to do with race. If the original art release for the game didn't give it away, then I'm giving it away to you right now. William Hughes at AV Games unironically states the following, making my point. Quote, The most striking thing about the rank and file members of the project at Eden's Gate is how strikingly non-offensive they are. For a group of violent, gun-fetishizing secessionists, they're a remarkably apolitical lot, a diverse cast of backwoods crazies united only by their fanatical belief in their leader. End quote. Indeed, their apolitical nature is at the heart of what the game is trying to say. That Seed and his cronies don't care about your skin color or your gender. They just want to take advantage of people. They want adherence. Are there racist cults in America's history? Certainly. And there's no denying that what happened at Waco inspired white supremacists in America because they shared a deep distaste for the federal government with Koresh and the Branch Davidians. But a fanatical belief in one's leader is at the heart of a cult's structure and at the heart of cult worship. And it's also at the heart of Far Cry 5. Hugh seems to have lost a major piece of the plot along the way to boot that many of the people being taken under seed spell are victims, in this case of a weird mind control drug, perhaps an ode to the opioid epidemic that's flattening families across states like Montana. Or maybe not, although my theory makes a hell of a lot more sense than the gripes we've been talking about throughout this video. Over at Mike, a stupid article title about fascism in America portrays an article that otherwise hits the nail on the head. There, writer Jack Smith IV says, quote, It turns out that Far Cry 5's politics aren't completely obvious. Its writers back away from mainstream political commentary about extremism. In the end, it's not a game about liberal versus conservative, or religious theocracy versus liberty. Instead, the game itself is a cautionary artifact, an example of how the uniquely American obsession with cults protects us all from recognizing the extremists in the mirror." End quote. Finally, someone that gets it. It's not a game about all of those things. It never was a game about all of those things. It was never a game that was meant to be overtly political at all. 
The game's creative director, Dan Hay, told PC Games N as much, noting that the bleed over between Far Cry 5's themes and what's happening in the real world is coincidental. The game's themes are deeper, darker, and more nuanced than yet more We Hate Trump fluff. Like, enough already. It's funny because Far Cry 5 came out the very same week the American sitcom Roseanne returned to television after a 20-year hiatus. Roseanne, a sitcom I absolutely adore, tells the tale of a Midwestern working-class family that can barely make ends meet. So far, the new season is wonderfully written, funny, clever, and a joy to watch. But since Roseanne voted for Donald Trump both in the show and in the real world, and since the show doesn't deal with certain issues precisely as professional victims would have liked, even as it shows incredible open-mindedness in terms of race and gender, it's getting unfairly criticized. One critic went as far as to say that even though it's great, she still can't watch it because of its politics. This sort of bizarre behavior, this level of incompetent, ideology-driven criticism, is precisely what we're now seeing in games more and more. Kingdom Come Deliverance wasn't the end of the road. Far Cry 5 won't be either. It makes one wonder if there's any pleasing certain people, or if certain critics will ever be happy with anything that doesn't fit their exact specifications. Thankfully, there are more of us than there are of them, and we can continue to even out the conversation with thoughtfulness, staying even-keeled, being objective, and remaining fair. That Far Cry 5 isn't about Trump is perhaps its greatest strength, because it gives us a break from the monotony of the outrage machine. It's refreshing, really. Maybe that's why it's pissing so many people off. Okay, that's it for this episode of Colin's Last Stand SideQuest. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, leave comments below. I'll be reading them. Thumb up the video if you liked it. Thumb it down if you didn't. And please share SideQuest and all things Colin's Last Stand, Fireside Chats, Knockback, etc. with friends and family. Everyone should know about the might, the majesty, and the wonder of Colin's Last Stand. I will waste no more of your time, but I do appreciate the time you have given me today, and I will see you next time for more SideQuest. Until then, keep on gaming.